This tape is the second of two that describe the head and neck. In it, we'll look first at the facial muscles and the scalp, then at the brain and its surroundings, then at the nerves and blood vessels of the head and neck, then at the eye and the ear. We'll start by looking at the face. Some important parts of the face, the nose and the orbit, are covered separately in these two tapes. In this section, we'll focus on the facial muscles, which produce the movements of facial expression. We'll go from above down, starting with the muscle that closes the eye, the orbicularis oculi. All this is the orbicularis oculi. It surrounds the opening between the upper and lower lids, the palpebral aperture. Orbicularis oculi has an inner or palpebral part and an outer or orbital part. The palpebral part is extremely thin. The orbital part is more substantial. Orbicularis oculi arises medially from this underlying structure, the medial palpebral ligament, and from the bone above and below it. Its fibers pass above and below the palpebral aperture, joining with each other here. When the palpebral part of the muscle contracts, the eyelids close gently. When the whole muscle contracts, they close tightly. Opening the eye is caused by elastic forces acting on the lower lid and by a more deeply placed levator muscle acting on the upper lid that we'll see later in this tape. Now we'll move down to look at the muscles around the mouth and the nose. The opening between the lips, the oral commissure, is surrounded by the orbicularis oris muscle. Here's part of it. The orbicularis is joined and overlaid by several other facial muscles, which we'll remove from the picture for a moment. Here's the orbicularis oris by itself. Its more superficial fibers encircle the oral commissure, some of them arising from bone here. Its deeper fibers are continuous with those of the buccinator muscle, as we saw in the previous tape. The action of orbicularis oris is to close the oral commissure and press the lips together. The deep hollow here between the buccinator and masseter muscles is filled with this buccal fat pad, which is continuous with the fat that covers the front of the cheek. Now we'll return to the picture all except one of the muscles that pull on the orbicularis oris. Pulling on it from above and behind is the zygomaticus major, which arises from here on the zygomatic bone. Pulling on it from behind is the risorius muscle. We use both these muscles when we smile. Pulling on the orbicularis from above are zygomaticus minor, absent in this instance, levator anguli oris, and levator labii superioris. These arise from here on the maxilla. Together, they raise the upper lip. The most medial corner of levator labii superioris, which goes by this very impressive name, attaches to the alo cartilage of the nose. It does this. Here on the side of the nose is the nasalis muscle. It helps to wrinkle the nose. The three muscles that join the orbicularis from below are quite hard to tell apart. They're depressor anguli oris, depressor labii inferioris, and mentalis. The last two run into one another and are embedded in this mass of fat and fibrous tissue which forms the prominence of the chin. These three muscles arise from here on the mandible. Between them they pull the lower lip downward and pucker the chin. The last muscle we'll add to the picture, the platysma, lies partly in the face but mainly in the neck. Here's the neck as we saw it in the last tape, without the platysma. Here are the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the infrahyoid muscles, and the digastric muscle. Now we'll add the platysma to the picture. All this is platysma. It lies within the subcutaneous fascia of the neck. Its lowest fibers extend below the clavicle, onto the chest. Platysma has a free posterior border here and a free anterior border here, near the midline. Most of the fibers of platysma insert here along the border of the mandible, but its more posterior fibers cross the mandible and insert into the orbicularis oris complex. 
The platysma pulls the corner of the mouth downwards and backwards, producing these ridges beneath the skin. Now we'll move on to look at the scalp. To understand the scalp, we'll start with a dissection in which all its layers have been removed, exposing the skull. The dome of the skull, known as the calvaria, is formed by bones that we've seen in the previous tape. The frontal, parietal and occipital bones, and on the side by the squamous part of the temporal bone. The temporal bone is covered by the investing deep fascia of the temporalis muscle. Overlying the calvarium is a layer of loose connective tissue, the areolar layer. It overlies the deep temporal fascia too. The areolar layer separates the bone from the next layer that we'll add, the assembly of structures known collectively as the epicranium. The epicranium is formed partly by tendon, partly by muscle. To see it better, we'll add all of it to the picture. Over the dome of the skull, the epicranium is formed by a sheet of tendon that's known as the gallia, or gallia aponeurotica. Two muscles are attached to the gallia. In front, the frontalis, and behind, the occipitalis. The occipitalis muscle arises from here on the occipital bone, above the superior nuchal line. It inserts into the gallia. The frontalis muscle arises from the gallia and inserts into the skin of the lower part of the forehead, close to the eyebrow. These two muscles produce important movements of facial expression. When occipitalis and frontalis act together, the eyebrows rise. When frontalis acts by itself, the forehead is pulled downward in a frown. The full effect of a frown comes from the added effect of these not very separate muscles, depressor supercilii and procerus, and by the more deeply placed corrugator supercilii, which pulls the eyebrow medially, causing these vertical wrinkles. On the side of the head, the epicranium is formed by this area of dense connective tissue, the superficial temporal fascia. In some individuals, as in this different specimen, the epicranium includes the vestigial auricularis muscles, which can move the external ear. Now we'll add the more superficial part of the scalp to the picture. Firmly attached to the epicranium is a layer of fibrous tissue interlaced with fat. Above this is the hair-bearing skin of the scalp. These are the hair follicles, which extend through the thickness of the skin. That brings us to the end of this brief section. Now, let's review what we've seen of the facial muscles and the scalp. Here's the orbicularis oculi, its palpebral part, and its orbital part. Here's orbicularis oris. Here are the risorius, Zygomaticus major, the vator anguli oris, the vator labii superioris, and nasalis muscles. Here are the depressor anguli oris, depressor labii inferioris, and mentalis. And here's platysma. Here's the areolar layer of the scalp. Here's the epicranium, consisting of the gallia, the frontalis and occipitalis muscles, and the superficial temporal fascia. Here are the procerus, the depressor, and the corrugator supercilii. That brings us to the end of this section on the facial muscles and the scalp. In the next section, we'll move on to look at the brain.